Good afternoon, my name is Nancy Estevez from HL Magazine and we're here today to interview two top attorneys on the COVID-19 legal ramifications, PJ Mitchell and Spencer West from Mitchell and West Attorney Law Firm in Coral Gables. Well, we wanted to do the, you know, I wanted, because, you know, I met um, PJ and I think he, you guys are wonderful, um, you, you know, and I, I wanted to give our readers Apart from talking a little bit about, you know, the firm, I wanted to give our readers like a kind of a, a scenario on some of the hot topics, how you see it, because the doc, you know, the medical doctors say one thing, um, and there's, you know, whole different stories about that. But I think what's really going on now is something totally like, you know, unprecedented. And wanted to see like, what have you found are the top legal issues? and how it can affect some of the, our local business people when they open up now. Um, because a lot of people are really concerned, like, what's gonna happen to me? Um, am I gonna get sued if I have a restaurant? Um, all, all those things, how do, you, how do you see that? Apart from the, you know. The yeah, from, from, my, from my perspective, in terms of my practice, which is, which is family law, I deal with, obviously, people in all walks of life so every type of job from physicians to um, you know clerical workers to uh, business professionals so literally whatever you know every line of work you could imagine I've represented somebody that you know affected by the you know the closures I you know but what I was saying is you know for instance I got a call yesterday from a from an old client who's been furloughed from a major company he's worked there for many years he's He's a high ranking executive there and he's not going to be able to meet his financial obligations, um, you know, soon enough after, after the furlough happens and there's going to be, you know, millions of people, unfortunately, that are in his position looking to, looking to figure out how they're going to not only meet their own obligations at home, but their legal obligations, whether it's paying in my practice, alimony, child support. Um, attorney's fees, things of that nature, it's, it's difficult because people have, you know, legal and financial obligations um, by court order and they're going to have a difficult time uh, meeting those obligations. So the court's going to have to figure out ways to furnish both temporary and permanent, um, you know, methods in order to get them back um, on their feet once they are working again, which is going to be difficult. And I think probably some of the laws will probably have to be maybe rewritten in some ways or I don't know about, I don't know about rewritten but I think that you know in family court it's a court of equity and they they're going to be tasked with the position of giving people temporary relief that may turn into longer than temporary relief I don't know that laws will change but I do know that it, you know if somebody does not have the ability to to pay something okay. through their own fault at all not they're not they're not purposely not meeting their obligations um, and the courts told them that they have to by court order or they've agreed to it you know in a settlement agreement then there's going to have to be provisions that the court's going to have to take steps to to not only protect the person who has the financial obligation but also the person because on the flip side of that there's somebody relying on receiving that money for child support or receiving that money for alimony or whatever the obligation is and that's going to be an issue as well well, well, the other problem is I think a lot of people, for example, the self-employed have not been able to get in Florida unemployment. And so months into this, there's a lot of people that are just out of work with no, no capability of getting any help. So that's another thing. I mean, do you, are you, are you going to see a lot of suit lawsuits on the Florida unemployment for not, because they said that they were going to pass this whole thing about helping the self-employed small businesses and it never really happens. I would assume that there'll be lawyers that will take cases to, you know, try to help especially small businesses and people that were affected that weren't getting the help that they might have been entitled to by government uh, loan or grants. It's, it's not something that I, you know, it's not part of my practice and not something that I'd be uh, involved right. in. I, I would imagine that you'll, you'll have you know, plenty of those because there's going to be people that lose their businesses and, and never. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure that um, there, there probably will be. Um, 
What about medical malpractice? I know you guys do some of that, no? We've had cases in the past. It's not the major crux of our practice. We do a lot of premises liability in the, in the plaintiff's world or um, um, uh, negligent security cases. Uh, okay. But we have had medical malpractice cases in the past, and it depends on which avenue you want to discuss regarding the liability. But uh, I think what you are seeing, at least in the personal injury world, is an uptick in the uh, in the cases being filed. Um, I think that that um, will continue at least through the rest of this year. Um, I don't think that you'll see uh, a balancing out of that until next year this time. Yeah, because a lot of people in the beginning that that died that went into the hospital because they didn't have you know the, all the masks and you know the, the tests were negative false negatives and all that stuff going on i'm sure that at some point it's going to it's going to be crazy the amount of lawsuits of these these families suing no well i think what you're what you're going to see in that uptick is, is nursing homes being sued nursing homes that, right? nursing homes being sued and that's a little bit different because what you would typically the way I view it, the way I would probably craft the, the complaint is uh, violations of uh, protocols, policies, and procedures, which is a negligence count. Uh -huh. um, and I would, um, you know, that that you will see. You do see some lawyers advertising for that now uh, through television and through uh, radio and some other social media avenues. So you will see those cases. Um, but typically, it'll be a one or two count complaint, which will be filed against a nursing home. And also, on those nursing home cases, you have to be careful because there's no, you know, there's no requirement that the nursing home uh, have insurance. So, if it's a mom and pop nursing home, okay, then what's 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 the actual recourse going to be? So you have to you have to be careful and selective on on any type of nursing home case as well as medical malpractice cases. But you think like, does forced manure come into play when when something like, when these type of lawsuits for medical malpractice because of this strange disease or no, doesn't affect? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You know, the, for, the forced manure clause where, you know, it's been a big, you know. I, I, think, I think you will see uh, the uptick in negligent uh, causes of action filed against nursing homes. I mean, I can tell you, uh, you know, we've been contacted regarding one particular, one particular potential client. Um, and the way that I view this particular uh, scenario is, is violation of protocols, policies, right. and procedures. I, I keep going back to that because I think that that would be the solid uh, cornerstone of, of the complaint regarding nursing homes. Right. Now, in your opinion, do you think that there could be a lawsuit against the government for waiting so long to kind of put everybody in quarantine, like that kind of lawsuit, is, is that going to be possible? I, I tell you what I think is more interesting and what I would explore more is um, suing municipalities. Um, you would have to give, there's a condition precedent of giving notice when you sue a municipality under 768 Florida statute. You also have to give notice uh, to uh, the Florida Department of, uh, uh, you have to give notice to the state. Um, and you do that by providing a, a notice letter. Um, and once you do that, you meet those conditions and you lay out what the causes of action are in that notice letter, then you can proceed against the municipality. But the way I view it, uh, regarding these unilateral orders issued by mayors, they don't, they don't have the authority to make the law and then to force the law. And the government doesn't matter if it's a state or municipality uh, or the federal government can't come in and shut down businesses. I mean, what essentially they did in certain parts of the country and, 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 and even in Florida and certain counties uh, is what they did is they basically put everybody in, in house arrest. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can't do that. The, you know, the federal government can't come in and mandate it in a pandemic. They can't do that. But not everybody understands that, right? And, and they issued these unilateral orders, these mayors did, that said, okay, only uh, essential workers 
can go into work. Well, well what's an essential, uh, an essential worker? We're all essential. Exactly. So the question becomes, were some of these orders that were issued by these mayors, was it, was it excessive? Did, that, did those powers, did they go beyond what they were legally uh, obligated to do? And if they did, then in my humble opinion, I think that you could give notice and I think that you could, you could sue on that basis. I mean, they came in and basically shut down all, all businesses. Not only did they do that, they came in and said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to put curfews on everybody. But the, just because you, just, just because you, uh, you want to have a quote unquote, we're having a pandemic, doesn't mean individual people lose their constitutional rights. And so what they've done is they basically shut down all the businesses and told people, you, you, you can't go into um, private businesses without wearing a mask. Well, they can't come in and mandate right wearing masks to private businesses either right but what they did is they took the cdc Got protocols it. right and then they turned around and adopted that and then they tried to enforce it on the american people look we're all you know the basis of the constitution is individualism right we we have a right to make a decision uh, as to our own health as well now i'm not saying that the government doesn't have under the 10th amendment the right to implement certain certain restrictions, but they can't come down and put people in, uh, shut their businesses down totally, and then they can't go in and, and tell everybody, hey, you're gonna have to stay in your home. So, you know, those uh, those are those are things that I would look at. But you also have have to understand that if you're suing a municipality, you have to look at, you know, there's a uh, there's a cap under sovereign immunity. So, you know, the cap in the total is $300,000 as well. So, oh, so that's the cap, 300 that's the cap when you sue, when you sue, right. when you sue a municipality, uh, you have to be selective, um, your causes of action and your defendants. And that's my humble, that's my humble opinion. Well, and, and not only did they put people in their houses, but how many people have lost businesses is ridiculous. I mean, and then, then Florida, doesn't offer a quick solution for unemployment either so that that becomes even i mean talking about you know florida um yeah. becomes even harder for people and then now to recuperate all that um who knows you know because they're opening in little parts and bits and pieces so i mean the restaurant business i'm sure is probably one of the worst hit no yeah the restaurant tourism business yeah we've had a lot of friends um contact us. I mean, they've lost their job. But let me tell you, I can just tell you from personal experiences, you know, one individual was, was making a six figure job. They quote unquote furloughed her. And that's essentially they terminated her, terminated her employment. And, and what will it be before she gets back a job like that another year, if ever? Oh, it ruins her life because if yeah. you have mortgages to pay and then that's the other thing. I don't know if you guys work on any of those cases, but what about the banks? Like, what are, are the banks going to the foreclosures and all that stuff? Are they stopping that? I, I think that the, I, I tell you what I think Congress needs to do and what they should do. They should go on there, pass the next bill and put a line in, in the legislation requiring the banks to allow everyone to, you know, for those months of this uh, COVID uh, crisis, that they put it at the end of the mortgage, right? And let them keep continue to pay through it. I don't think, as a result of this, people should be punished on their credit score. Um, I think that uh, Congress needs to take action doing uh, passing that type of legislation. Exactly. No, it, it, I, I totally agree with you. Um, question, because I wanted to ask you some uh, some questions about the new case that you have. Um, Daisy was telling me the one with the uh, YMCA. J J L versus. Are you are you able to talk about that or no? I I can talk to you about it. It is public record. Okay. Um, we had sued uh, two defendants. We uh, J L, which is a, let me let me explain the backdrop. First of all, okay. J L is a is a five year old autistic little boy uh -huh. who, uh, who was uh, participating in an after school program here at one of the schools in Miami Dade County. So we filed a five count complaint, uh, three counts against uh, the Y M C A two counts against the, uh, the local school board. And uh, essentially uh, in those counts, uh, what we said is that they failed to provide a safe place uh, 
or jail, right? right. So he insisted to have a higher duty. They were previously put on notice that this other student was quote unquote bothering <laughs> him. Right. And what turned out is there was a sexual assault on the five year old autistic little boy. Right. And they had noticed that another, yeah, another student was, well, he was sodomized. So, I mean, you can oh. imagine what the mother of the little boy, because the mother had previously gone up there and advised them, hey, this, there's a problem with this other little boy. Um, who, it, you know, coincidentally ended up sexually assaulting him. Um, so, you know, we, we are pursuing that. We're pursuing that against uh, the whites. It's, it's actually the local YMCA. They're called associations throughout the, throughout the United uh -huh. States. You have the YMCA National Council, then uh, they have different uh, uh, associations throughout the country, and it's uh, different uh, segments, uh, you know, Southeastern Division here, mm -hmm. uh, which would fall on the uh, YMCA of South Florida. So that's that's who we sued, and we're in litigation on that. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting case. A lot of these cases that I do handle revolve uh, are involved sexual assaults and um, or unwanted touchings as well. So it, it is a it's an important case for a lot of different reasons. Of course, we, we need to get justice for this young this young mother. Um, it and it can affect this little boy for the rest of his life. Well, of course, it probably already has. You know. So, I mean, how do you fix that? I mean, that's traumatic because it's under seven years old. It's going to stay with him for the rest of his life. I don't, I don't think, look, there's no amount of money in, in these types of cases that we handle, uh, whether it's the wrongful death or these sexual assault cases, that can ever make someone feel whole, right? Ideally, we would never want anything like this to happen to anyone. That being said, in our system, uh, the only way that a uh, party can be compensated is, is through the economic system, essentially. Um, now there may be some non-economic components that could be uh, negotiated, uh, such as prevention uh, in certain cases. But you'd be surprised that um, some of these defendants don't don't want to always do that. Well, so look, we're fighting. We're fighting for her. We're fighting for her son. And uh, well, for the for the world, really, when you think about it, because. We don't want it to happen again. In, in this, in the after-school program, it, it happened before. It happened before. So this isn't the first incident involving the, the YMCA uh, here in South Florida that it that it happened. It's, it happened before. Wow. Wow. Well, guys, I won't take up any more of your time. If you wanted to mention anything else, that, I mean, I, I wanted to kind of give people the scenario of what's going on. I know you guys are experts. So um, I really thank you for, for giving us this, this information for our readers. Well, if thank there, you. If there's anything else you wanted to add. Spence, you got anything? No, just uh, we appreciate you uh, reaching out to us. And um, if you ever need anything in the future, let us know. Oh, thank you. Yes. And, you know, we'll continue some of these talks as things come up. I mean, you know, it's great to have you guys, our, our, our legal reference here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. the opportunity. We really do. Thank you. All right. Talk bye bye. See you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. bye.